Hello, my name is Matthew Hunter with Legacy Wilderness Academy, and I'm on a mission to document every edible and medicinal plant in the southeastern U.S. so Southerners can have greater access to nutritious food and free medicine. In today's video, we're going to be looking at the only plant in North America that's high in caffeine. It's called the Yopon Holly. In this video, we'll look at how to identify Yopon Holly. I'll show you where it grows, and I'll show you how to harvest the plant. We'll take it home, and we'll prepare it into a tasty tea that's high in antioxidants. Stay tuned. Before we begin, I'll quickly mention that if you want to learn more about the useful plants growing in our region, make sure that after this video, you download my free guide to medicinal plants of the Southeast, which you can find in the link in the description below this video. Yopon holly is a tall shrub in the holly family, the same family of plants where we get Christmas holly. It has a scraggly appearance and it usually grows from about six feet tall to about 20 feet tall. And it can grow anywhere from full shade to full sun. It's a very adaptable plant. And you can see here, there's not a lot that stands out about it uh, when the berries are not around in sort of the off season. So let's take a closer look at how to identify Yopon holly. The leaves of Yopon holly are evergreen. So it's a plant that can be found and harvested throughout the whole year. They're about an inch long on average. The ones here are a little bit longer because this plant is grown in deep shade. And the leaves have a blunt tip and what we would call scalloped or crenate margins, which means they have teeth along the edges, but they're not sharp or uh, sawtooth-like. They are uh, they're blunt and sort of rounded teeth. Yopon holly leaves are alternate in arrangement, which means they stagger along the stem. You have one here and then another here and another here. Um, they never come out at the same place along the stem. So you'll notice that they're, none of them are coming out of the exact same place opposite one another. And so that's important to remember that they have alternate leaf arrangement. In the spring, Yopon holly has small four petaled white flowers. They're not very noticeable. They're really easy to overlook. But then in the fall, the plant has bright red berries in very large amounts, and they're about the size of a pea. So here we have some of the berries before they ripen. This is actually the most distinct part of the plant. So I'll go ahead and put a picture up of what they look like when they're fully ripe and they're gonna be absolutely loaded with these red berries in the fall and throughout the winter, making identification really easy, even from a distance. Um, and so one thing I do need to say is that the male and female flowers uh, are on different shrubs. So you'll have some shrubs that are loaded with berries, some shrubs that don't have any, and the ones that don't have any are gonna be the male shrubs. So I usually harvest from the male shrubs just to make it easier because the berries themselves are actually toxic the part we're after is the leaves and uh, not the berries. Lastly, mature yopon hollies often have clusters of multiple small trunks and the bark is smooth and gray. Before we harvest the leaves, I'll show you exactly where this plant grows. So yopon holly is most abundant in the deep south. It's gonna be found in the southern half of the Gulf Coast states from East Texas to Florida, and then it hugs the coast in the Carolinas, North Carolina and South Carolina, really a coastal species. As you go north from the Gulf Coast, uh, it becomes more spotty in distribution. It does grow where I live in Northern Louisiana, for example, but it's a lot more spotty. So in the deep south, it's really a dominant understory shrub. It makes up, you know, it's, I would say it's like one of the most common plants in the whole forest uh, in the deep south. As you move further up, it's more spotty. And then in the northern part of the map I'm showing you, it's really only planted in landscaping. So it really doesn't grow in the wild. Uh, for example, like in the upper left of the map, you'll see little spots right there in Oklahoma City and Tulsa, Oklahoma. It's not gonna be growing wild uh, in those areas, but it is so common in landscaping. So there are a couple different varieties you'll find in landscaping. For example, there's a dwarf variety that's just like a knee-high shrub. It's very common in landscaping. Um, in grocery store parking lots, fast food, restaurant uh, parking lots, you'll see it just uh, heavily trimmed and shaped. Uh, and then you'll see also a weeping variety that does grow taller and it has that sort of weeping willow appearance with the arched over branches. And so that is where yopon holly is usually gonna be found. So to harvest yopon leaves, all we're gonna do is strip the leaves right off the branches. And we don't have to worry about hurting the plant by doing this because the leaves are gonna grow right back. This is a plant that is like impossible to kill. I have seen people uh, literally trim the bushes with a weed eater and it just keeps coming back. So um, yeah, definitely not really worried about hurting this plant. Now, if it's a really hot summer day and you would rather strip these off in the comfort of your own home at your kitchen table, then what you can do 
is just cut the branches off, a pair of clippers, and we can harvest it that way as well, okay? And so we're gonna just harvest a bunch of leaves and then I'm gonna take them back to the kitchen and I'll show you what to do next. Next, we'll go ahead and rinse our yopon leaves so that they're free of any dust or debris. And after that, we're gonna begin the roasting process. Now, most people will dry their leaves before they begin the roasting process, but for expediency, I'm going to go ahead and uh, put them in wet. So I'm gonna spread the leaves out on a baking tray and go ahead and put them in the oven at about 350 degrees. And because they're wet going in, I'm gonna to have to take this tray out multiple times throughout the process, stir them around, make sure that none of the leaves are stuck together and that they're all drying evenly. And when we're done, here's what they're gonna look like. They are a dark brown color. And uh, this is what we're gonna be crumbling up and using for tea. Next, all we're gonna do is crumble up our yopon leaves by hand and they'll be ready for tea. So roasting isn't the only way to prepare yopon holly leaves. You can also just dry them right on the counter and make a green tea. Uh, personally, I don't really care for the oven roasted yopon leaves, but I really do like the sort of green tea. If you're gonna do that though, you know, I think the roasting sort of um, helps break down the leaves and release the caffeine. So if you're gonna do a green tea without roasting, um, it would actually be beneficial to let the leaves age for a month or two, and that's gonna help the cell wall sort of break down, form these little microscopic holes in the cell wall so that when you steep them, more caffeine is gonna be uh, released into the tea. And then uh, my favorite way to actually prepare yopon is by fire roasting, which gives it a totally different flavor in my opinion. So I do that when I'm out camping in the field, you have a fire, what you wanna do is you wanna harvest a few uh, straight, uh, unbranched sections of yopon. And the reason you want them unbranched is because you don't want a bunch like sticking out when you have a little bundle, because then they'll burn. Cause you're gonna be putting this little bundle right next to the fire. And if you put it just at the right spot, it'll quick dry the yopon leaves and it'll give it this really good flavor. And you can sort of just rotate the bundle within 10 to 15 minutes, all the leaves will be dry and you can crumble it up uh, into your tea, which that's uh, what I like to do when I'm out camping especially if you forget coffee. So um, the benefits of Yopon is that uh, it's obviously has caffeine. It has about the same amount of caffeine as green tea, and it's also packed full of antioxidants. So it has flavanols and polyphenols that help reduce oxidative stress in the body, which of course is good for the brain. It's good for the heart. Uh, it's good for slowing down the aging process and you know avoiding things like cancer, cardiovascular disease, age-related mental decline, all the things that antioxidants uh, are good for. And so you may be asking, Matthew, if this tea is so good for you and it tastes really good, how come I've never heard of this caffeine rich tea that's growing right here abundant in the Southeast? And there are a couple reasons for that. It's a really interesting history surrounding this plant. So one of the reasons is that uh, people think that after the Civil War, people started associating Yopan Holly tea with poverty. Um, and maybe there was all, it was also sort of associated with sort of something that the Indians uh, drank. And so um, that's what people think. We really don't know exactly why the cultural reasons of why it declined. Um, but one of the main reasons we do know is that this uh, plant got stuck with a, a very interesting scientific name. So I've sort of withheld the scientific name thus far. I usually say it at the beginning of the video. The scientific name of this plant is Ilex vomitoria okay and so that name has scared a lot of people away from using the plant so let's talk about this plant's interesting history yopan holly was one of the most culturally important plants to native americans uh, living in the southeast region virtually every tribe that lived in the southeast 
uh, drank you up on holly tea. And there was a certain uh, significance, a, a religious significance associated with this plant. It was a plant that was drunken um, only by important males usually, and it was used for purification. It was a drink um, whenever you would have special guests over, like uh, Europeans and government officials. Um, it would be drank before special events like going to war or certain games um, or, you know, maybe different types of, of rituals. And um, there is this interesting ritual uh, for Native Americans, not only in the Southeast, but all throughout North America and South America. Uh, it's a purging sort of ritual. And the idea here is that uh, people wanted to have this sort of ritual purity. So there's religious reasons that people would be doing this. And what they would do uh, is they would induce vomiting. So they would force them, uh, themselves to vomit. And this, to our ears, sounds very strange, but to Native American tribes living in the Southeast a couple hundred years ago, um, or maybe, you know, three, four hundred years ago, this would have been a very normal practice that was done in front of other people, and it was done quite regularly and sort of on demand. People would just be vomiting at certain times during these rituals. And so, um, and one of the plants, or the main plant they probably used for this was Yopon Holly. Now, the thing we have to remember is we don't actually know how they made this certain brew, uh, they probably made either a very strong brew of Yopon Holly, they may have mixed some other herbs in, regardless of exactly how it was made. Um, this plant is not going to make you vomit. Let's make that very clear, okay? It's just like drinking green tea. Uh, I just you drink a cup and I definitely won't be vomiting anytime soon. And so because of this interesting sort of cultural and historical significance and the association with uh, you know, being a purgative, this plant got stuck with the name Ilex vomitoria and has scared so many people away. Uh, but one um, group of researchers out of the University of Florida actually did a taste test, a blind taste test with one of Yopon Holly's relatives, Yerba Mate, which some of you may be familiar with. And so Yerba Mate is sort of a health drink that has become popular in some circles. And it is a, a relative in the same genus uh, as the Yopon Holly. It's Ilex paraguensis from Paraguay at the Yerba Mate, and people found that people actually prefer the flavor of Yopon Holly more than the popular Yerba Mate sold in stores. So people are buying Yerba Mate when they could be uh, getting it right here from the wild of the Southeast or buying local from some of the local uh, businesses that actually sell Yopon Holly. And so guys, I'll leave you with a couple remarks from a Spanish priest out of St. Augustine, Florida, which were made around the year 1615. He said, there is no Spaniard or Indian who does not drink it every day in the morning and evening. And he wrote that any day that a Spaniard does not drink it, he feels that he is going to die. So I think Yopon Holly Tea could replace coffee as the drink that if you don't have, it'll make you feel like you're going to die. I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. Hey, again, my name is Matthew Hunter with Legacy Wilderness Academy. And if you want to learn more about medicinal plants of the southeastern U.S., make sure to download my free guide to medicinal plants, which you can find in the link in the description below this video. Have a great day.